Today I'll be talking about, uh, in the session of pathogenesis, about long COVID, and I'll be talking about mitochondrial function that's decreased in long COVID patients and myopathy. And I will discuss two studies of the Amsterdam UMC, where I'm a physician, uh, to show you a little bit about the data we have in our center and uh, what we're doing. No conflict of interest, uh, we do receive funding from the patient at Research Collaborative. And the story, like many stories that we're all doing here, started with COVID-19, the acute infection itself. So this story uh, was published, uh, I think it was in 2022, uh, where they had a young female admitted on the ICU, intubated, and they took a skeletal muscle biopsy. Some of my colleagues did this. And what they saw in this young female that shouldn't have any muscle defects, that they saw focal necrosis in the skeletal muscle of the vastus lateralis. Uh, they saw regeneration. Uh, they saw mit mitochondrial complex uh, abnormalities. And that got us thinking. If these things are present in acute SARS-CoV-2, maybe they're present in long COVID as well. Um, so today I will discuss two studies that derive from this, actually. So first study I'll be talking about is skeletal muscle pathophysiology that we examined during post exertional malaise. And the second one is prolonged IDO2 presence with mitochondrial function in immune cells. First study I was talking about in muscle pasc studies, a collaboration between the Amsterdam UMC and the Movement Sciences. Uh, we study post exertion malaise and, to, and look at muscle abnormalities. So we're in the last stages of uh, submission, so it's, uh, they, they accepted it, but it's not, still not online, so please do not spread the pictures yet. Uh, hopefully this month it will come online. Um, and before I start talking about this, I think it's always a good idea to, you know, formalize what we're talking about. So before I was talking about acute COVID-19 and intubated patients. When I'm talking about long COVID, I'm not talking about post-hospitalization syndromes or patients. I'm, ta I'm not talking about the deconditioning, the malnutrition these patients have. As we all know, if you're intubated, you can be lying in bed for a month or so. And what you see then in the muscle is completely different what we see in long COVID in young patients. I'm not also not talking about aging patients where sarcopenia, clinical frailty plays a role. Now I'm really talking about the young patients, uh, mostly female, as we know, that often have a very mild infection, not admitted to the, uh, to, uh, to the hospital, and that also have post-exertional malaise. And post-exertional malaise is uh, a very frequent symptom, actually, among long COVID patients. Uh, according to this article, around 70% of all uh, patients with long COVID have it. But it's, it's a really bad symptom. If you have seen a patient where you induce post exertional malaise, you know what I'm talking about. You can set the re rehabilitation process back for like three, four weeks even, and sometimes even permanently. So it's not only physical, of course, that's something we have to keep in mind. It's also cognitive and emotional that can induce post exertional malaise. Reading a book, socializing with friends, driving, going to a doctor's appointment, going to a study visit. All these things can induce post exertional malaise. And we, in the study, did it a little different because we wanted to make sure that we had post exertional malaise, so we did a bite test. A maximum bite test takes around 15 minutes. It gets heavier and heavier per minute if you cycle, and it's made to fail. So at a certain stage, everybody fails. If you're healthy or not, you fail. Only long COVID will fail probably at a lower level. We examined skeletal muscle tissue one week before and one day after this bite test to see longitudinally what is changing in these patients. We also took blood from these time points so we can really create an in-depth profile of what's going on in these patients. That was the muscle stuff. So now about the mitochondrial stuff and the IDO2. Uh, this is the second study I'll be talking to you about. Um, it's a study uh, in collaboration with some partners in the Amsterdam UMC as well. Rene Luther, you see on the right-hand side, and Le Guo. It's a paper published in August uh, this year. Uh, where we see IDO2 presence uh, in immune cells, uh, which is associated with cellular stress and, uh, in long COVID patients, which uh, I will elaborate a, a little bit further on. Um, first about IDO2, we also have an IDO1. When we have a two, we have a one, of course. Uh, so we have IDO1 and IDO2, and they're both involved in the tryptophan kinering pathway, which you see here on the, on the right-hand side. So they're actually the first step in the degradation of tryptophan uh, in that pathway. Uh, and normally, IDO2 should not be present actually that much. It's mostly IDO2, that's uh, IDO1 that must be present. And IDO1 is induced by interferon gamma. Uh, it's associated with uh, the interferon response as well. Uh, it's widely present, like I said. And if the cells express in, uh, IDO1, they're also protective, uh, protected against uh, uh, interferon exposure. Normally, 
this IL-1 goes away after two to three weeks, after the infection is a little bit gone. Uh, IL-2, on the other hand, stays positive. It has a positive feedback loop. Um, these cells that express IL-2 are not protected against uh, autophagy and apoptosis, and it should rarely be there. A good thing also to remember about this pathway, the kinerin pathway, is that certain metabolites within this pathway are neurotoxic. For example, kinolic acid as a neurotoxic uh, metabolite. Kinolic acid, for example, is again, is instead neuroprotective. So that's a little bit about background of IDO. IDO is not new, by the way, uh, in chronic fatigue, uh, LANS, and ME, and long COVID. A lot of it is being published already, We're calling it a metabolic trap. For example, it's been spoken about for many years. A lot of studies are quite active in it. Uh, also, the serotonin study, of course, where we show that a low serotonin is uh, found in long COVID patients. That was quite recently released, of course. Uh, also, a study from the Netherlands where they show that patients treated with SSRI with serotonin actually do better, uh, are also all involved in the pathway with tryptophan. So it's not new, but what we did new uh, what we did new is look for IDO2. And normally people only look for IDO1, and we looked for IDO2. And this story again started in the COVID-19 itself. So COVID-19 is uh, it's a beautiful place to start and it's to get ideas from. We had a lot of funding, of course, in that time. Uh, long COVID is a little bit less, but we're trying to get there. And what we found in COVID-19 is they took pulmonary tissue from deceased COVID-19 patients, and they stained for this IDO1 and this IDO2. And normally, you would expect IDO1 to be present. Eh? You have SARS-CoV-2, a virus, you have interferon gamma pushing up the interferon one, uh, the IDO1. But we saw that rarely. We actually saw a lot of IDO2 in this pulmonary tissue. And this shouldn't be there. We saw a lot of autophagy as well, a lot of apoptosis. So this got us thinking, could this also be present in long COVID? And we started at the beginning. So I showed you this pathway. So we just measured in the blood in, in our long COVID patients. What are we seeing regarding the measurements of this? Uh, and the main finding here is that kinolic acid, where I told you about, is a neurotoxic uh, element, is way, way higher in long COVID compared to healthy controls. Fatal cases of COVID-19, it's even higher, but in long COVID, it seems to be higher. Uh, kinolic acid, which should be neuroprotective, is lower in long COVID patients as compared to healthy controls. All interesting signs that something is going on in this pathway. So we dived a little bit deeper and we did the staining. So we stained for IDO2 and IDO1. We took the immune cells from the patients. That was the easiest accessible material for us. Of course, we have the muscle section, but they will follow later. And interestingly enough, enough we rarely saw IDO1, which can happen, of course. But the fact is, in C and D, which I'll show you, there's a lot of IDO2 present. And IDO2 just should not be there. We saw it in all kinds of lines of uh, immune cells. You saw it in the macrophages, you saw it in the T cells, you saw it in the B cells. A lot of IDO2 was present there, uh, which could cause perhaps some of the symptoms. So we decided to take a little step further, and we decided to co-stain uh, for apoptosis and autophagy markers. And we tried to see if we could block IDO2 with a, uh, on, a, a, H, a, a AHR antagonist. Uh, so the first line is to just the controls, and at the bottom two rows, we added an antagonist. Um, what you can clearly see in the first picture is that there's a lot of IDO2 presence, uh, there's a lot of apoptosis, there's a lot of autophagy in the, in, the two, in the second picture. And the moment you start to add the antagonist, IDO2 expression goes down, apoptosis goes down, autophagy goes down. If you add more of the antagonist, even more is going down also shines that this process could be reversible. This is, of course, uh, not in humans yet, so that's, of course, the next step we're going to see. Are, are we able to uh, uh, diminish those IDO2 in actual long COVID patients and maybe diminish the symptoms in long COVID patients? So we also decided to look at, is this doing damage in these long COVID patients? We, we had the immune cells, so what can we use as a damage marker other than the stainings we did. So we decided to look at the mitochondrial respiration. Of course, a little bit uh, based on by the skeletal muscle tissue respiration that we saw. And also in these immune cells of long COVID patients, you see a diminished respiration in the immune cells. So we have diminished respiration in the skeletal muscle cells. We have a diminished respiration in the immune cells. These mitochondria are not functioning properly. And it's also visible again uh, when we perform a metabolomics. You see also 
that certain products within that TCA cycle are downregulated, citric acid, one main component in there, severely downregulated in long COVID patients as compared to healthy controls. So with this study, I tried to summarize for you that this SARS-CoV-2 triggers a long-lasting IL-2 response, uh, and that specific metabolites uh, within the cunarine pathway uh, can actually are best kind of related to the symptoms we're seeing in long COVID patients. And that combined with the results of the first study that I showed you, where we show severe myopathy, metabolic, metabolic, metabolic disturbances, mitochondrial respiration that was diminished, uh, we, we provide a little glimpse in what we do and what we think is a possible explanation of, uh, of long COVID patients. And we think that mitochondrial dysfunction, the presence of IDO2 and the myopathy we see in long COVID patients are key characteristics uh, of long COVID uh, as we see. Of course, I want to thank all the people involved with this product, from the product uh, with, this, uh, with this work from the Amsterdam UMC and from the VU. Of course, all, also our funders. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, this is what I had to say for you today.